Hello, everyone. Welcome back for another edition of The Money Pros. I'm Oliver Tutts, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner, and I'll be your host for the next half hour as we talk about all the issues related to your money, how to make it, how to keep it, and hopefully how to help it grow. A lot to get to on today's show, so let me give you an idea of what we're heading toward here. First off, uh, interesting start to the year and an interesting end to the year when it came to uh, the stock market. We saw a major decline in the fourth quarter, and now in the first quarter, uh, of uh, 2019, we've seen a pretty uh, impressive stock market rebound. I want to talk a little bit about that and dig into the numbers because it's actually a little more detailed and nuanced than you might uh, expect uh, just by following the headlines. So we're going to talk about that in our first segment. In our second segment, I have our financial planning pro, Matt Sweet, certified financial planner and enrolled agent with Randall Financial Group, my partner at work. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what's becoming a more and more common topic, which is parents helping their adult children with their finances, whether it be giving them money, co-signing for loans, or any of a host of other ways you might uh, be helping out a kid. We're going to talk about the do's, the don'ts, the things to consider, and why this is becoming an increasing trend that we're seeing more and more of in our own practice. Uh, so we're going to talk about that in the second segment. Third segment. Interesting. I saw uh, this story and I said I got to share this with the Money Pros audience. Some bad news in the world of personal finance when it comes to kids. The tooth fairy's cutting back on his allowance. And we're going to dig into the numbers there. And finally, we have a question on IRA contributions. So, all of that to get to in today's show. Let's start off with uh, the stock market. Um, starting about the beginning of October of last year, we saw a major decline in U.S. markets. Uh, markets were somewhat ho-hum for the majority of 2018. It actually looked like we might clock another positive year. Uh, and then in October, uh, as we say, the wheels came off the wagon for a variety of reasons. Uh, and we saw a pretty major decline. The broadly watched S&P 500 that we talk about uh, a lot on uh, this show, and of course you see in the news all the time, actually ended up finishing the year down 4.48%. Uh, uh, and that was the first negative year since 2015 for the S&P. And it's the worst single year it's had in the past 10. So although negative 4.48% is not a disaster by any means, it certainly was notable. And all of that decline came in the fourth quarter. If you would just look at the fourth quarter numbers, you would see the S&P decline of actually over about 15%. Um, but it gets more detailed than that. There's some nuance that I think it's worth uh, pointing out because people don't dig into the numbers like we do, and I want to share some of that with you. So let me throw up a slide and tell you exactly what I'm talking about here. So we're talking about U.S. markets. Now, international markets did poorly uh, as well last year, particularly emerging markets was down. But this slide focuses specifically on U.S. markets. And you can see over on the left here, 2018, large stocks represented by the S&P down 4.48%. But it was actually worse than that. Small stocks, small cap stocks as we call them, were actually down 8.48% or twice what the S&P was down. And mid-sized stocks uh, were down uh, over 11%. So the declines were substantial. In fact, in mid and small stocks, uh, we actually saw from their peaks in October, the decline was over 20% in both of those categories, which would actually be considered a bear market in those categories. But because the beginning of the year was more healthy, the overall 2018 averages uh, weren't quite as bad uh, as you might have seen if you looked at uh, the fourth quarter numbers uh, for the markets. The other interesting thing, and now we move on to the right side of the graph, is starting the day after Christmas of 2018, markets rebounded. In fact, we, we hit the depth of our lows Christmas Eve of 2018. But the right side of that graph is detailing what's gone on so far in 2019 as of the taping of this show. And what you can see is a substantial rebound in all classes. In fact, large stocks being the S&P 500 up 12.88%, uh, small stocks up 11.52%, and mid-sized stocks up a whopping 14%. So we're talking about a significant decline uh, in the fourth quarter, which gave us an overall decline for 2018 in a variety of different categories. Uh, but what we've seen is a pretty remarkable uh, rebound. And I think this points out a few things that you really have to keep in mind as an investor. One of them is not all stock sectors are the same. When we talk about pundits, your neighbors, people at a cocktail party, whoever it is, when we talk about stock market performance, we've really got to think about what stocks we're talking about because there were broad differences 
in the performance of various stock categories, which points out the importance of having a well-diversified portfolio, and just owning the S&P is not necessarily well-diversified. The other thing that it really points out is the reality that it's virtually impossible to time markets. If you panicked with the declines in the fourth quarter of 2018 and pulled your money out of the market or some of your money out of the market, you probably missed the rebound that happened uh, in just a matter of days uh, in the first quarter of 2019 that got most investors back to even. But if you were sitting on the sidelines, you're still sitting on those losses. So some interesting numbers to talk about here on The Money Pros. Now, up next, we're going to be talking to our financial planning pro about giving financial assistance to adult children. Stay tuned, there's more to come. Welcome back to The Money Pros. I'm joined now by Matt Sweet, uh, our financial planning money pro. And Matt, I think we've got an interesting topic. This just seems to be something that in my practice, I'm sure in yours as well, is coming up more and more as our clients talking to us about how they can help out their adult children. So we're not talking about a 16, 17 year old, but maybe somebody who's uh, a parent themselves. And we're talking about the, the parents of our clients' grandkids in, mm -hmm. in many cases. So yep. let's talk about some of the obvious things first and start off by saying, once a kid turns 18, financially, what obligations do you really yeah. have to them from a, at least a legal standpoint? Yeah, well, 18 and out of high school, and that, that would be about it. Yeah, so uh, our legal obligation would end there. However, perhaps our um, moral obligation or uh, what society expects might uh, I think might that's change. a big factor is what yeah. society expects. And as I was thinking well, about that expect. question, <laughs> right, of course, that's a whole other kettle of fish. But... Um, as I was thinking about this, there are some recognitions within the law or within you know formalized yeah. regulations that recognize parents' obligations to kids beyond that. I think yep. specifically about college. You know, when you apply <clears throat> for financial aid as a 18, 19, 20 year old, it's very difficult to apply without using your parents' finances that's as right. a means of support. So yeah. I mean, that's one issue. There is the expected family contribution. Sure, exactly. So whether, that, whether you get it or not. That's sort of a recognition by the government that, hey, your kid is an adult, but we know you're still responsible that's for it. Right. There's recent provisions in health care law that allow adult children to stay on uh, health insurance policies until 26. Right. Um, and there are also other aspects of tax code where you can keep your child on as a dependent for various credits. While they're students, like that. yeah. So there's a lot of different kind of things going on here. Um, but what I want to dig into is do you think, you know, setting all that aside, that changing economic times have made it more necessary or uh, required for adult, uh, the parents to help out their adult children with finances? Has something yeah. changed in our society? Well, I think many things have changed. I was thinking back to what, what our, the experience of, say, our grandparents would have been, where they probably lived with their parents after they got married. And today that would be unheard of. You know, so it's obviously things have changed since then, certainly. But also uh, other things that are, have changed is the, the, the wherewithal of parents to actually help their children. You know, the, the, the financial ability is significantly greater than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So they, in some, in many cases, parents actually have the money that they can help. And at other times, it would, it would have been impossible. You know, it, it, we don't dig into a, a lot of cultural stuff on the show, but this is, I sense a lot of cultural animosity between younger generations, millennials, and whatever other letters you can sign to <laughs> yeah, that, right. and older generations, baby boomers, their parents, because there's definitely a sense out there that baby boomers and that generation, generally speaking, sort of line their pockets, uh, whether you talk about tax policy or economic policy, and now uh, millennials are paying the price for that. I think about what we paid for a college education right. versus what uh, a student has to pay yeah. for a college it's education It's prohibitive now. at this point, yeah. Housing costs, things like that yeah. have become much more expensive. So there's definitely an economic, I think we can agree, there's yeah. definitely an economic shift that many feel like uh, it almost necessitates a need to be able to, uh, to help these kids. What are some of the common ways that you're seeing 
uh, parents want to help their adult children? What are some of the most common sort of topics, let's say? Well, it, it, the, the first most obvious would be college. I mean, pe parents are thinking about this, this from their, when their kids are toddlers. They're already planning, thinking about how are we going to pay for this. They have a real understanding of the, the daunting task. Of, sure. Uh, both for them to pay for and for their children. You know, and they, and they really don't want to ha have their kids end up with a lot of debt. And they, they recognize the danger of that. Uh, many, I'm seeing many people um, helping their their um, uh, their kids a after college to pay for pay some of the college loans, mm -hmm. you know, either through Parent Plus loans or helping their kids pay their own loans. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what about things like um, home purchases? Yeah, you know, that, oddly enough, that's somewhat uh, more rare. I think maybe it's just uh, it, it doesn't happen as often, but. Um, you know that does come into it as well. I, sometimes you see uh, parents uh, co-signing on loans, you know, with, uh, with with their children so that they can actually purchase a home, or um, you know, helping with down payments. I think another common thing is um, not so much maybe uh, paying the rent or helping with a mortgage or a down payment, yeah. but just the idea that kids can't afford to live on their own at this point. Yeah. Uh, they either take on three or four roommates so they can share the cost, or, uh, and we've talked about this on the show uh, before, uh, kids staying at home yeah. for longer periods of time. And that, in essence, is a form of support. Financial absolutely, assistance, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So we're talking about food and, uh, and housing and things like that. There's a lot of different ways you can help out mm -hmm. a kid, and we don't want to you know, be judgy about what the good ways and the bad ways are uh, necessarily. But what would you say are some of the things you've seen people do or want to do that you would generally caution against or think yeah. very carefully about before proceeding? Well, I, I can tell you that people, even the people who have helped their kids in certain ways, many times regret it um, or regret having to have done it. Things like uh, digging kids out of uh, credit card debt or uh, from other types of mistakes that they've made um, or helping them purchase a home. Uh, sometimes it goes bad, unfortunately, um, and so those are the things that I've, at least I've seen uh, with the clients where they have, it didn't work out the way they'd hoped, I can certainly say that. Right, and I think it's fair to say that there are, um, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I was looking at the notes for the show and one of the comments you made is, help digging kids out of financial bad choices, mm -hmm. that, and that seemed like a good way to sort of characterize the dividing line between is this going to advance your child is this going to enhance their life in some way uh, that is positive or are you just trying to rectify a mistake they made right. and that's something to consider don't you think it is it is and unfortunately if you um, as much as you might want to help somebody uh, oftentimes giving them money to dig them out of a problem reinforces the bad behavior that got them in there in the first place right it's kind of a form of financial enabling for yeah. those of you that have had to deal with you know people that you know have had addiction mm -hmm. uh, issues, but you know paying off credit card debt would certainly be yeah. probably an example of yeah. that. I don't know bail money. <laughs> um, yes. There's probably a lot of different yeah. examples where bad choices. There should be financial ramifications, and yeah. if you rescue them from those uh, bankruptcies, things like that, um, then you really got to consider that closely. Um, what about things like? Uh, and I've gotten these requests before, um, pulling money out of retirement plans or even co-signing for loans in some circumstances. Yeah. Well, those are real danger points. I'm co-signing co for a loan. The problem is that you very well might be the one ending up pay paying for it. You have to recognize that um, before you sign a sign in the line. And the cost of taking money out of retirement, particularly before your retirement age, is is very, very costly. The, the, the penalties and taxes on it are extraordinarily high. But even after retirement, this is what you have to live on. And so, uh, you know, to take money out of that for something other than your own retirement may not be a wise choice. And I think uh, it's important to overlay, you know, we're talking about adult children yeah. here. So the parents that we're dealing with and advising are near or in retirement. Right. So if you all of a sudden become responsible for a car loan or a mortgage payment or uh, the payoff on a credit card uh, as a cosigner, uh, at a time when you're living on a retirement income, you may not have the flexibility to make those payments. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a scary thing. If if kids ask for money, should you feel entitled? And we talked about social obligations. Mm -hmm. Should should you? 
feel entitled to dig into their personal finances and ask them questions about what it's for? Yeah, I think parents feel a real obligation, you know, obviously. And, and, but then, yeah, somebody asked you uh, what, was, uh, what was not your business before all of a sudden becomes your business. And you, you, you have the right to ask quite tough questions, you know. Are you on a budget, you know, and, uh, you know, things like Why that. are you asking me for $10,000 for this when you just took a vacation exactly. to, uh, uh, you know, the Bahamas mm -hmm. last month? Um, right. You know, I think we're conditioned, particularly here in the Northeast, to, to there's certain subjects that are taboo. That may be becoming less and less the yeah. case as our society evolves. Sometimes I want to get back to some of that. But, um, you know, asking people about their finances is something that is uncomfortable. But I, I do think it's fair to say that if your kid is asking you for money, mm -hmm. or if you're in a situation where you feel like you might need to give them money, that it's fair to ask some, like you said, tough questions yeah. about, um, about where the money's going and how they're budgeting. Are there ways you can help your adult kids with money that don't actually involve giving them money? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, teaching them the right way to do it, you know, encouraging them to, you know, have a budget. And, and, and also sharing with them perhaps some of the struggles you've had and how you've, uh, you know, uh, how you've managed yourself, you right. know, because it's, people think it's somehow magical. You know, you just always, the bills are always paid and there's, you know, how, does, how is it that mom and dad have the financial wherewithal? Well, it's because they made good choices over time. It starts when they're young. I mean, I, I've had a number of clients ask me to sit down and talk with their kids that have just gotten married or have just gotten yeah. a job just to point them in the right direction. And I think that, that some of that education it can be more valuable than a dollar you might be able to handle. Uh, great topic. Some of the questions we didn't even have a chance <laughs> yep. to get to, but I think this is something people are going to see more and more commonly, so I think it's worth continuing to explore. All right, up next, the Tooth Fairy's cutting back. We'll give you the numbers. Stay with us. There's more to come. Welcome back to the Money Pros. Uh, the uh, dental insurer, Delta Dental, uh, for the past 21 years has been tracking an interesting uh, financial statistic, and that is uh, the payouts uh, and a variety of other details surrounding the payouts uh, attributed to the tooth fairy for lost teeth. And the headline caught my attention because apparently uh, the payout declined in 2018. Uh, relative to 2017. So wanted to share some of the statistics with our Money Pros viewers in case this was relevant to their personal finances. Lord knows I've been there. So, all right, here you go. Some of the interesting numbers. Uh, first up, the average tooth uh, value uh, for a lost tooth is $3.70. And I think that's coming up. Uh, there you go, $3.70 for the average uh, cost per tooth. The 2016 average was $4.66. So we've seen a two-year uh, decline in uh, what the tooth fairy is paying out in teeth. They also get into regional information. I thought this was interesting. The highest paying region in the country is the West Coast, maybe not entirely surprising, and the lowest paying region is uh, the Midwest. Uh, where uh, between the highest and the lowest, uh, the value of the tooth varied by approximately a uh, dollar. Some other statistics that you might find interesting as well. 2018 a uh, average is down 43 cents from 2017. It's the second straight annual decline. I think we talked about that. 2016, it was as high as $4.66. It's now down to uh, $3.70. Uh, the trend has, and this is probably not that surprising, the trend has historically followed approximately uh, the S&P 500. So it's interesting, the stock market often makes, has a lot to do with consumer confidence. And so it ripples through a lot of financial decisions. And as it turns out, uh, it's rippling through the decisions that the Tooth Fairy makes as well. The average here in the Northeast, we talk about regional numbers, uh, is $3.75, so just a little bit higher than the national average. Uh, in the survey, almost half of kids, 48%, uh, indicated that they save their money rather than spend it, which I think is a delightful trend. I would love to even see that uh, increase. And finally, 30% of kids go to bed early when they have a tooth to stash. And I can testify that I remember doing that as a child. I also remember putting things like nails and bottle caps under my pillow to see if I could fake out the tooth fairy. Uh, not so much. So definitely an interesting trend. Um, and one note about the S&P 500 thing, I do think we run uh, the risk that if kids find this out, so uh, don't tell your kids, and kids, if you're watching, close your ears. But 
if they find out that the value of the tooth is somehow attached to the S&P, we run the possibility that they're going to stockpile their teeth until they see that the market is at some kind of peak uh, before they actually go to cash in. So be forewarned, parents, um, how the stock market does has a lot of ramifications uh, for your expenses and your income, and no more so than when it comes to the tooth fairy. All right, that's it for that segment. Up next, we're going to be talking uh, or answering a viewer question on IRA contributions. So stay with us. There's more to come right here on The Money Pros. Welcome back to The Money Pros. Uh, viewer question, and actually, I probably field this question. I'm going to estimate 10 or 15 times uh, per year this time of year. And the question is this. How do I know if I'm eligible to contribute to an IRA and when should I be making the contribution? And some version of this question, like I said, we get this question a lot. So here's my advice for people that want to contribute to IRAs, which I, by the way, I think is a fantastic thing. And most of you are eligible uh, to do that. In fact, everybody's eligible to contribute to one. It's just how it's treated uh, that uh, could change depending on how much income you have. But here's my advice. Everything has a season. Apple picking, tulips, the list goes on and on. And also having a season is IRA season. And IRA season is the same as tax season. So my advice is this. It's best to figure out your IRA contribution when you get your tax return done. Because the tax return will determine if you're going to make a traditional IRA contribution, whether or not that contribution is tax deductible or not, and if you'd like to do a Roth contribution, whether or not you're actually eligible to do the Roth contribution. Now, this confuses some people because they say, well, I want to make the contribution for last year. Well, you can do that. Up until April 15th, you can make a contribution to your IRA for the prior year. So I don't recommend systematically contributing throughout the year to an IRA. You don't want to get caught in a situation where you contributed to a Roth and then it turned out you weren't eligible, or you contributed to your IRA and you thought you were going to get a tax deduction and didn't. You're better off to contribute the money somewhere so you have it stashed up. And then when you get your tax return done, you can figure out what you're eligible for, what the tax ramifications are. All the major software will do it. Your accountant will certainly answer the question. But that's the time. So everything's got a season, and this is IRA season. That's it for today's show. Thanks for watching The Money Pros. We'll see you again next week. Take care, folks.